what should the p uh, distribution of p values look like? We're going to get into this with Cardin Kruger. Cardin Kruger's paper is a meta analysis, sort of a study of publication bias in the minimum wage literature. Basic idea, uh, and we'll come to it with Cardin Kruger, is given a certain effect size, if you're really well powered, so you have a bigger sample, for the same research design and the same effect, you should have more precise estimates. Therefore, t statistics should be larger. Like, that's a pretty simple idea, and that's going to be the starting point of Cardin Kruger's, um, Cardin Kruger's paper. They're going to ask whether this actually holds. In, not in a literature with like three studies. It's going to be like 15 to 20 studies by the time they do their review in the mid-90s. So a decent body of literature on a very important policy question. Okay, so um, you know, they're going to be focusing on what happens to employment when the federal minimum wage goes up. Critical policy question. Um, and what they find is you know, their starting point is to say, well, you know, there was this kind of older cross-sectional literature of these 15 to 20 studies, and they tend to find these negative employment effects. Um, but the more recent cross-sectional literature, using better research designs, actually, tend to find pretty minimal effects, either smaller negative effects or zero effects. And they say, okay, you know, why is that? You know, one possibility is the research design is different. You're, you're actually, you think you're estimating the same thing, but you're actually estimating something different. That's one possibility. Um, another possibility they bring up, which is interesting as well, maybe effects are changing over time. Like maybe back in the 70s when the first studies came out, there was a certain effect of the minimum wage, but now in the 90s it's different. Like the economy changed. Other policies changed. The labor market changed. So there's a couple of reasons why you might see differences in different sets of estimates, but their preferred explanation, what they're going to come to and show a lot of evidence for, uh, isn't that at all. They're basically going to argue that there's just like pervasive publication bias in the older literature. And really the evidence isn't consistent with, um, with anything else. So some combination of publication bias and specification searching is going to lead to a very, misle- a very misleading literature on an incredibly important policy question where leading scholars in the leading departments were, you know, were working on this for decades and produced a couple dozen studies. Even in that case, they're going to say, we really can't trust this literature. So that's pretty important. This isn't some esoteric sort of exercise. This is really important stuff. People are testifying in front of Congress about major economic policy changes and based on 20 studies, and they're going to say, these studies do not have evidential value. Okay, so again, what we were just talking about, for a given effect size and a given research design, if you double the sample size, what's going to happen to precision? Precision is going to go up by root 2, right? Straightforward, or 41%. So sample size goes up given the same design, T statistic should go up. So do they see that? When they have more data, do they see T statistics that are twice as large? Well, this is the square root of the degrees of freedom. This is the square, you know, the, the absolute T ratio. So there's just this really striking pattern, which is most of these studies have T statistics just above two in these cases. There's just this cluster of studies, you know, right over here with values of two. And there's a couple that are you know, off, that, off that line. When they do regress the log t stat on log degrees of freedom, instead of getting a slope of one, they get a negative slope. So like, this is like deeply problematic. If it were zero, it would also be really problematic. It's negative. So it's like the folks out here with big samples, given the same effect size, right? Big samples should have bigger t-statistics. They've, these guys out here just get zeros. Like When you get lots of data, you get a zero. When you have a little bit of data, you just creep above a t of 2 somehow. You do a log specification rather than linear. You include you know, four lags of past residential investment, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do. That, that's what you do. So this is a deeply troubling literature. It's not one. It's sort of negative one. Here's another way of looking at the data. Um, again, we've got you know, the, you know, the standard error over here. And then this is the estimated effect. And um, what they plot out is two times, the, <laughs> two times the standard error. And you just get this like, incredible clustering of studies right above two times the standard error. Totally unnatural. And then again, what's 
really concerning here is these studies with really small standard errors down here, these are the well-powered studies with the, the you know, big degrees of freedom and whatnot, these are kind of like the, the small, the zero effects, right? Like the small effects. So those are probably the most reliable studies. Okay, so the bottom line is there's this literature of 15 or 20 studies. Despite all that work over a couple decades, it's, it's just not an informative literature. There's so much just obvious, blatant publication bias in the literature that um, you know, we really don't know what to make of it. And what they said is, look, there's this recent cross-sectional study that's well-powered with better designs that shows zero effects, and that's what we should be paying attention to. And they're like, oh, th that's our literature. Those are the papers we wrote. So, um, and they were right. 